I've often thought that one's life, if you look at it, is rather like the night sky. Suddenly, you'd see a star whose light had never been visible before, not because the star hadn't been there, but because the light took so long to reach you. And the light is the meaning. Childhood is full of stars whose light only reach one now. Suddenly you look at a very familiar night sky and you say, my God, there's another one there. And it's been there ever since the beginning, but you didn't see it before. You didn't see the meaning of it before. I first met Sir Lawrence Vanderpost at his apartment building in the Chelsea section of London. I had arrived about five minutes early for the meeting and discovered he was already waiting for me in the vestibule of the building. As always, the perfect gentleman. That day we talked about many things. About his childhood growing up in the bush of South Africa. We spoke of the 25 books he has written. Of his lifelong association with the Kalahari Bushmen. About his struggles against apartheid and color prejudice of his experiences as a commando leader and then prisoner of war in Java. He spoke about his close friendship with Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. He told stories of love and forgiveness. But there was one area of his life he simply would not talk about. So Lawrence, there's an aspect of your life I know that you don't talk about too much, and that's your relationship to Prince Charles. Why don't you talk about that? It's one of those things that hasn't a why to it. You know, why is a very limited question. There are things in one's life that one doesn't talk about. There's no harm in that. There are certain relationships which is wrong to let the world in on it because it doesn't belong to the world. It's not part of the world and the world spoils it. So he didn't talk about his relationship with his godson, Prince William, the future King of England. What he did talk about, however, were the journeys of his life. I don't really know where my grandmother was born. I don't really know where my grandfather was born, because they seem to have been always on the move. I have a sort of vision of them having been born in ox wagons or been born on a journey on a journey. Things happen on the journey. But my great-grandfather was one of the first to join in the movement known as the Great Trek into the interior of Africa. They moved so far ahead of the Great Trek, so far ahead of any protection he may have needed, and they were rather careless. One knew something from the hunters and people of the great Bantu empires, that it wasn't at all a safe place to go. Near the great Vaal River, worn out, they camped and thought, we've got water, we've got lovely grazing, we can settle here, and they scattered. They didn't form as they usually did a lager. And sometime in the night, my great-grandfather was disturbed by the young people and couldn't sleep, and they were very tired. And he said to their nurse, who was a cape-coloured woman and a liberated slave, take the children away, take them away, because we've got another hour's sleep before the dawn breaks. So the nurse took them down to the river when she heard the war cries of a great Zulu Matabili Impi, the army, who had been stalking them, and they completely surrounded the sleeping lager. And they fell on them and they murdered out the whole lager, with the exception of the children. My grandmother, her sister, and a young brother. About a fortnight later, another 
a great exodus coming up behind, better organised, with patrols scouting the country ahead, caught up with them and rescued her and the children. And in this follow-up behind was my grandfather. It was a very dangerous country and it was a question of survival. I remember my grandfather telling me as a child of what a savage interior it still was. It was full of lions. It even had cannibals in it. So my grandfather established himself not without an enormous struggle. He had the first European farm north of the Great River. His farm was called Bushman Springs because it had been the meeting place of a clan of Bushmen. You see, my, my grandfather um, had led one of the last raids against the Bushmen who had killed his cattle and the cattle of other Europeans. They decided to make up a commando and to eliminate those Bushmen. But my grandfather said that among the Bushmen killed, there was a Bushman who had a thong around his naked waist, and there were little horns and little wooden files, as it were, all with different colours of pigment and paint in them, and he was the Bushman painter of rocks whom they'd killed in the raid as well. And that always haunted me, that vision of the Bushman artist taking part in a battle and being killed. I always found it a dreadful story. I found I'd written in, my, in a little diary I was trying to keep that when I'm grown up one day, I'm going to those Bushmen and I'm going to ask and beg their pardon for all the terrible things we've done to them. At the age of about 17 and a half, I found a job on an English newspaper, and from then on I was out on my own. It became a natural step to be in rebellion against the laws and the increasing prejudice, colour prejudice and racial legislation. And it really ultimately became the basis of the first novel I wrote in a province, which was the first book ever written by a native-born South African openly attacking racial prejudice and apartheid. While I was working as a newspaper person, I found myself sent on one occasion to the capital, Pretoria. I'd gone into a very well-known Afrikaans restaurant which specialised in traditional Afrikaans waffles and coffee. And I was sitting happily at my table, having waffles and coffee, when suddenly I heard a very strident feminine voice shout out, um, Get out. I don't want any niggers in my place here. I was very startled by this. It was beastly, it was nasty, and instinctively, which I'm afraid is part of my character, so a reflex action which I've always obeyed. I was up and I walked to the desk and I saw facing the woman two oriental-looking gentlemen in Macintoshes, looking in a puzzled way at each other and then at the woman, not really knowing what was going on. And I said to her in Afrikaans, what's the matter? What are you doing? She said, well, can't you see? I can't have these people in here because if I had them, I'd lose all my custom." So I said, well, if you don't have them now, you will lose my custom. And before she could say anything, I said to the two people, would you two gentlemen do the honour of having a cup of coffee with me? I took them to my table, I introduced them to waffles and coffee, and we talked, and we became, I felt, great friends. They were two very civilised people two very distinguished Japanese journalists, Mr. Hisatomi of the Osaka Mayanichi 
and Mr. Shirakawa of the Osaka Asahi, the two biggest and most influential newspapers in Japan. A month later, it resulted in my getting an invitation from the Japanese government to go to Japan at their expense. And that started this great Japanese adventure in my life. I was free, as I'd never been in my life before, to meet another culture, another race, another history, without being preconditioned to it. Here were people dismissed in Africa as yellow peril, the people of immense culture and civilization. I found that the Japanese seemed to me ridiculously like the Bushmen. Their natural sense of religion was the sense of being connected to the gods through nature and the reverence for nature. It's deeply, deeply ingrained in the Japanese who would on a summer's day will go in thousands to certain places just to listen because at that place has a new kind of cricket voice singing to them in the summer. for a long time that when I had intervened in that cafe on that afternoon I was not dealing just with the manifestation of color prejudice as I thought so important in my country but I was saving my own life on a mountain in Java the mountain of the arrow Jaya Sempu in March 1942 happened so quickly the Japanese advance was so rapid when the surrender came in Java the little group of officers who had been chosen for it would not surrender but we would try and form the nucleus for sabotaging against the Japanese I formed a kind of headquarters for my little guerrilla unit on top of a mountain in the jungles of West Java. And I was disturbed by rumors that were coming up the mountain that the Japanese were massing somewhere near, but see, it didn't appear to be an immediate threat. I arrived from Johor, and then, of course, the capitulation of Java came, and General Sitwell said to me, well, look, you must memorize this name, but never write it. The name is Lawrence van der Post, who's out with a, a group of guerrillas in the jungle, and you might come across him. He also, I was also given <laughs> a little pill, which I thought was for malaria. It turned out to be cyanide. Uh, I didn't swallow it. I had no idea that already in the night Jaya Sempur had been surrounded by the Japanese. And I was going down the mountain, down the track. There was sort of an open space. And from all sides out of this, the Japanese were coming at me with bayonets. 
at that instinctively, I reached into my pocket for my handkerchief and I held up my hand. And my Japanese, which I'd learnt in Japan in 26 and in the ship in 26, 27, at 16 years before, came back to me. And what came back to me was the highest degree of politeness in Japanese, which says a lot because it's a language with many degrees of politeness evolving from the person who works in the fields to the emperor. And it was the emperor's kind of Japanese in which I called out as loud as I could, would your gentlemen please be so kind as to wait an honorable moment. And the shock was considerable, I could see it, because it was better than a bomb or a hand grenade, which they would have expected and reacted to. But they didn't have to expect to react to the highest degree of politeness in their language. And as I, heard, I called it out again, I think, a second time. And then the officer who was in charge, who had his sword drawn, dashed forward, put it into my stomach and said, was that Japanese you spoke? And I said, yes. He said, where did you learn it? And I said, Japan. And he sort of hissed beneath, between his teeth. He said, you've been to Japan? I said, yes. And then I knew I was safe. My father sent my mother, my brother and myself back to South Africa when he saw war coming. He thought it was going to be a rather long and nasty war. And I have very little memory of what happened other than one evening the grown-ups were whispering and one of my close friends said to me, I know something that you don't know. And I said, I know my father's been taken a prisoner of war. I was taken prisoner of war in Java in March 1942, and I think Solans came in just a few days later. Of course, at this time I was in such a state, you know, mentally I was rather confused with everything, but I do remember shortly after I was with him, he came in the same camp, yes. A truck carrying Bill Griffiths. Come on. Yes, a truck carrying <clears throat> Bill Griffiths arrived. He <clears throat> had been forced by the Japanese to move some very highly dangerous plastic bombs And one of them blew up in his face. And of course, he put his hands up and lost both hands and both eyes. I was, my hands, both hands blown off and totally blinded. And my right leg was broken in both bones, both bones in the tibia and fibula in both, both uh, on the one leg. And, uh, and that was it. But I remember I remained conscious and standing up and trying to walk. And then I got a terrible pain in my leg and went down. And I felt for my face, incidentally, but I couldn't feel it. So I thought, good gracious, my face has been blown away. And then I thought, well, it can't be. I'm still still speaking. But it was my hands, you see, that had been blown, blown off completely. Yeah. For months, for the first year, he didn't want to live. I mean, I should say to him, Billy, time is dealing with this. Give it a chance. Give it a chance, Billy. But there's far more than hands and arms to life. Far more even than seeing. Just hang on, Billy. And always messages came from Sir Lawrence. You know, like, keep your pick up, old chap, or something like this. And, and it used to do me a world of good. The first morning, I went on parade with the officers. The men booed the officers. And I thought, oh my God, there is something wrong. This must be put right. One can't have this. 
the most awful form of corrupting is the human spirit which hides behind its suffering and makes it an excuse for all forms of indulgences and violence and mere blind reaction. And I wrote a message to the cap which we pinned on all the trees. It was to the effect, don't think that the continuity of what you are and what your life is and what you should be has been broken because you've been put into prison walls. I said, this continuity is there. You've just got to rediscover it in a new way. And together, we can live our lives, perhaps in a way we should long since have lived it before. And out of this, we started what became our prison educational service. I first met him in spring 1942. I was lying on my bedboard in the bleak barrack room in Bandung Camp, Java, and I was reading. Suddenly I became aware that there was somebody standing beside me, and a voice inquired, what are you reading? And I noticed he was reading a book in French, and I stood by him quietly. He didn't know I was standing there, and I said, Tiens. Qu'est-ce que vous avez là-bas? And uh, in French. And he jumped us up as if he'd been shot. And this was Henry Rees, who became a remarkable chap, and who ultimately became what I called my director of education in the camp. 1,207 students enrolled straight away. We appointed 40 teachers. Many of them with degrees and some with further degrees. We wrote our textbooks on laboratory paper. We had no paper except laboratory paper, of which the Japanese, for some odd reason, gave us a superabundance. And the paper, this paper was so precious that it was never used for the purpose for which it was intended. We taught over 30 subjects, varying in range from modern languages, to astronomy, and to the culture of citrus fruits in Australia, and the making of wine in Australia, which were very popular courses with the Australians. I even had a Japanese class, people learning Japanese, because I thought just the fact that you're learning Japanese will change you, your attitude to the Japanese, and however powerless you are, a change in you will produce an equal and opposite change in your captors, although you may not know it. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. But yes. see, that's you. That. You gave us such fun. Oh, it's so lovely. And you ran such a marvellous show at the school. Yes. Do you know um, six people armed just with their lavatory paper diplomas we gave them yes. from school got into the foreign service on those diplomas? Six. Six. Not a bad record for a prison school, is it? I. Yes, it was something that kept me going, gave me a cause to stay alive. I. If the men could see a meaning in their life in prison, that would take care of the rest. There's one, ultimately, only one thing that makes human beings deeply and profoundly bitter, and that is to have thrust on them a life without meaning. And through this system of education, through the system of every person being in prison, really had a chance to be his full natural self in the terms of the spirit. The question of bitterness never, never arose. They wanted to know the skills that were in the camp, the technical skills, for helping uh, Japanese repair uh, essential machinery and, and, and arms and so on. Well, we refused to do it. And, of course, 
uh, Lawrence and uh, Nichols uh, and others uh, were made to be responsible for, for the refusal. One of the uh, more brutal of the NCOs, the famous Sergeant Mori, appeared and started ranting us and about this way that we were lying to the Japanese, that our spirit was bad, we were full of wagamama, and that this would not be tolerated, and the Japanese wouldn't have it. And so he started calling out the officers one by one, and began beating up the officers one by one. I remember Lawrence was called out and beaten, beaten with a stick and beaten with fists and kicks and punches. And My turn came about third or the fourth and uh, I was called out and I went up and presented myself, stood to attention in front of this mad, ranting Japanese officer and he began to beat me up. They beat me up pretty severely and then pushed me away. But all the time I was thinking, how am I, how can I stop this? What am I to do? And as I walked away from him, it was as if a voice in me said, go back and let him beat you again. He walked, he t turned around to, to walk away and then walked straight up to, to this Japanese who was doing it for more, almost daring him to do it. And the Japanese, they were absolutely floundered by it. And he raised a chair, which I think he was going to smash on the next victim, and looked at me. And then suddenly, something happened to him. Somebody he recognized, but this isn't the pattern. This, I've seen this before. I've done this already. And uh, he, be he became sort of confused. So he took a half-hearted swipe at me, pushed me away, threw the chair away, and stalked away from the ground. And I, I knew then the pattern had been broken. This pattern of madness in him had been broken by an untoward incident, and I knew that for the moment we were safe. In every human situation, all reality is always between two. And there's always this great responsibility, I believe, laid on all of us by life, that the person who's most aware, the person who's most highly, most completely, most widely conscious in a situation of conflict must accept responsibility for the person who's less conscious, who is, and that is the person who's possessed. He did change uh, one's perception of things. Um, he widens the lens. Uh, he un uncovered things in oneself. I remember a particularly nasty execution to which Nichols and I had to go with our young officers. They killed two soldiers whom they claimed they'd found looking through a prison fence. And that was a lethal offence. The way those two unknown Ambonese went to death was really indescribably moving. One was tied between um, the two bamboo posts driven into the ground and they really had bayonet practice on him. The other one had his head cut off. At one moment when the killing started, the execution started, um, an officer who was standing between Nichols and myself and was rather frail He'd been tortured and he was frail and not very well. It was more that he could take and he was about to fall. And we felt, well, if we fall, because on our right I could see in a small Dutch detachment a lot of people were fainting. 
at the site. I said, it mustn't happen to us because it will spread. We must face this upright and look it in the eye. And I put my hand round this man in a way the Japanese couldn't see to hold him up. And as I did so, I felt Nichols from the other side instinctively was also doing the same. And this poor chap, Horriban, immediately I can still feel his whole body straightened and he stood up. And he looked at this man being bayoneted without flinching. Because one didn't want to look at it. I wanted myself to look away and pretend it wasn't happening. But a voice inside me said, you can't do that because you're betraying the man who's being killed if you do that. You must go through it with him. That's your contribution here and now. You must go through it. You must be killed with him if you're going to understand what's going on. But I wanted him to look. I could easily have looked up at the sky and not seen it and been somewhere else. But uh, uh, there was... I wanted to, that was an, an impulse, was to run away psychologically. And but we, everybody stood fast and looked. And because somehow we lived our life in prison so that we looked at reality. We looked for the solution in reality. We looked for it in truth. And what greater gift can you get from life? It may sound strange to say that uh, life in a prison of war camp uh, can be uh, a valued experience, but it was to me, and because principally of, of meeting Lawrence. Well, you know, people very often uh, say to me about uh, human instincts, how can you trust them? Because it just makes you behave like an animal. But I think animals behave very well. There's no harm in behaving like an animal. People have these glib things. They said, oh, you, why, you must have been like a lot of wild animals in prison, just living out of your instincts. It's not true. Animals behave according to the laws of nature within them. Animals aren't lawless. There is an instinct for law and order is very deep. I could take you to places in Africa and I'll make you a lion, for instance. Kill a zebra in a herd of ze zebra. And the lion will charge and the zebra will scatter. And he'll pull down the zebra and he'll kill it. And the moment he's pulled it down, all the zebra stop running away. And they will come and graze a few yards away from the, where the lion is eating a zebra, because they know he will not kill more than he needs to live. It's when man degenerates and uses his natural self for having power over others that he becomes like a wild animal and sets a very bad example to animals. On, I think it was August the 17th, I was sent for by the Japanese. I was so weak at the time, we were all very weak from starvation, that I was seasick. I didn't, could hardly hold myself together. And I was marched into a room where the Japanese senior officers were sitting. And I noticed they had some wine and wine glasses there. And as I walked in, they all jumped up and bowed to me, and I thought, oh my, I began to quake at my knees, because I thought, oh my God, this, this is, they're going to surrender. And then the general suddenly said to me if I would drink with them, and I said, no, thank you, I wouldn't. And they held up their glasses to me, and the general said in broken English, we drink sincerely to your victory, and tossed down the wine. I just bowed like that. And then he looked at me and he said, we Japanese have decided to switch. And when we Japanese switch, we switch sincerely. And 
after the end of the war. 